Dr. Summers self-representing. Oh, okay. And as long as that is taken out, everything else should be the same. Miss uh, Johnson or Miss O'Connor? Uh, I have the other one. I'm, I'm sure you've changed, but I have one on page four of 60. said 1.6 pro se defendant. Oh, yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's not water 2.1. That was going to be read if he right. was, but okay. Right, that's the only change. Okay, not a problem. So 2.1, um, I'm reading the three pages, and then 2.1a, which is one page, I'll be reading this morning. Let me just take a look at... <laughs> It usually says something about alternates, and I don't, I, I, or even that there are alternates. I don't say it until I release the alternates at the end. And, and I think that is in there, though, Judge. Yeah, let me take a look. Um, so, so I'm not going to read. Um, No, I thought it was towards the end. It's all. It's usually in there, and I catch it on the fly and, and leave it off. So if in fact we're not fine, it is in there when I'm reading. I'm pretty good about not saying anything about alternates. I it was usually in that sentence. Yeah. After the final instructions are given, you will retire to consider your verdict. This is the way it should be. It doesn't say the the standard says the alternates will be released and you will retire. So this is in perfect uh, condition, in my opinion. Mr. Marchese, you uh, uh, seemed like you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, I, I need to address the court before we get started with the trial. That's not a problem. We, uh, we are ready to start because we're waiting for speakers. So, whatever you need. We can do it now. Uh, Your Honor, uh, there's been a lot of transfer back and forth on strategy and tactics between myself and Mr. Summers. We've had disputes about this Understand. since my beginning. When I... Since your beginning in this case, but not your beginning. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, so, on counts one and counts two, the defendant is charged with the most serious crimes of attempted murder. Yes. And so, from the story and the scenario and the way I understand the facts to be, I believe that Mr. Summers is entitled to a defense of abandonment of purpose. And so, I filed an invocation notice of intent to use the affirmative defense of abandonment of purpose. It is in Florida Statute 777.04, subparagraph 5, subparagraph A. Basically, as I explained to Judge Fuson, I shoot at you, but I miss because I'm a bad shot. It's still attempted murder. In this case, Mr. Summers is charged with attempted murder, one with a pillow, one with a rope. With a what? With a rope. Okay. And so, the testimony, my the testimony will be that he stopped. He abandoned <laughs> that person. And in that, under the statute, that is an affirmative defense that if in the commission of the crime he decides to back off and abandon, he rob a bank and he decides is it a bad good idea to leave or attempted murder with a pillow, where he decides that this just isn't uh, what I should be doing, and he stops, I believe we have the affirmative defense of abandonment of purpose, and I have asked for a jury instruction that I have submitted. Now, when Mr. Summers decided to represent himself, the first thing he did was strike that affirmative defense. I don't know. But now that the case is back with me, I want to give all notice to everyone that I am re-invoking the affirmative defense of abandonment of purpose for count one, count two, and attempted murder, and I asked for a jury instruction on the same 
pursuant to Florida Statute 777.04, sub 5, sub 8. Okay, before I can decide whether a jury instruction is appropriate, these discussions, and usually it's self-defense, come up at um, charging conferences where I have to make a determination whether there's any evidence, and the bar is very low, any evidence to support the instruction. I'm not anywhere near a stage that I can make a determination whether there's any evidence to support such an instruction. The issue here is the withdrawal of and whether you would e ever even be able to make that argument that there is some, as, as minor as it may be, evidence to support such an instruction. So I'm not for prejudging the determination because I haven't seen any evidence, um, and no offense to you, but what the lawyers say is not evidence. So if I was to get past this striking of the affirmative defense and revert back or whatever, then I would allow you at the charging conference to make argument that there is some evidence to support a instruction of that nature. So I just want to make sure we're, we all understand what. But what is the state's position regarding the defendant when he was represented pro, pro se striking the abandonment affirmative defense? Judge, it's the state's position that it's not going to qualify and that it should not be read to the jury. And well, the when you say not qualify, is it because you don't think there's going to be evidence to support it? Correct. We're not arguing that now. We're arguing simply the legal issue of the, the striking of it and whether or not at the charging <laughs> conference the defense would have the opportunity to say, we request this, and I say, what's the evidence to support it? And then they have to establish throughout the course of the trial there was some slight evidence to support it. Well, Judge... Case law is very clear that if there is evidence that would support a defense and the defense requests a jury instruction as to that, it should be allowed. Okay, even if they struck. It's the only thing I'm trying to get through is that you have to raise affirmative defenses. Right. They did, but then he struck. So it sounds like you're okay. You want to put the argument off until the evidence is in. We do a charging conference, and if there's evidence, any evidence to support it, then I should give it. That's correct. Okay, not a problem. So don't worry about the striking of it. The state would ask that there be no reference by defense counsel in opening statements as to that uh, abandonment as there is no evidence of that at this point in time. And well, then there's no evidence of anything prior to opening statements, so that would make both of you have to just stay seated and not be able to say anything during opening because there is no evidence in the case at this time. Right. What about self-defense? That's, they get to argue self defense, not argue, you can't argue in opening, but they get to talk about self defense if that's their theory of defense in opening, but then they might not get the instruction if at the time of the charging conference there's been no evidence to support it. So why should I treat the abandonment in opening different than I treat um, self defense in opening? Well, Judge, I would argue that it's similar to self defense, but secondly, the abandonment language that the defense is requesting is not even a part of the standard jury instruction for attempted murder. Secondly, uh, Well, I'm not going to give the instruction unless there's any evidence to support it. And then if I decide that there is some evidence to support the, the allowance of the instruction, I will look to see if there is a standard instruction on it, and that would be the instruction I would most likely give. They certainly can argue whatever they want, that they want some alternative to the, but we don't get there if I don't decide there's any evidence to support it. I agree. Okay. And you're telling me there's not going to be any evidence, therefore I shouldn't allow them to argue in an opening. And I, I just don't think that that's the, the status of the law. If you have some, if you have some um, authority, if you want a moment to um, present some authority to me that says I can't allow them to argue their, th not argue, I keep saying argue and I, I apologize, to present their theory of case in opening because there is no evidence of it, I would love to see it. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Students, be careful not to make promises in opening that you can't keep. That's, that's the, there's no rule, but if you talk about things in opening that don't come in or that you don't get in the end, then that's the, that's what you suffer. I, I tell them to be careful. Just, it's just making the uh, objection for the record. And what objection are you making? As oh, to them mentioning yes. abandonment in opening. Yes. 
because there's no evidence of it. Exactly. Deny. Judge, as well, the instruction he wants to use is not in the standard instruction. It's not part of the, it's not the okay. law. He wants to add it Stop. in. Stop. Okay, wait a minute. It, is there a defense of abandonment? In not to attempted murder. Not the way he wants it put in. He's prepared In his any own. way. I'm not saying, like I said, when we get to the charging conference, if I determine there's any evidence to support the defense going to the jury, then I will determine what instruction goes to the jury. If there's a standard instruction that's written by the Florida Supreme Court, then that's usually what I use. If they want to argue some other, I'll listen. But I, 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 we're, we're, we're splitting hairs here. And is, so is it the state's position that there is absolutely no defense of abandonment to attempted murder? And if so, then let's, let's flesh that out. And if that's true, then I will tell them that they cannot talk in opening about something that doesn't exist. However, if there is a defense of abandonment in whatever form to attempted murder, then they're welcome to suggest it in opening and then come to me in the charging conference and point to what evidence supports it before they get any instruction on it. In Don't worry about what his instruction says. Is there a defense of abandonment that could be raised under the proper form of the instruction to attempted murder? The way he is going to present it to the jury with the instruction he has prepared is not the correct law. It's not the correct law and it's going to be confusing to the jury and well, misleading the jury. One of the main objections during either opening or closing is misstatement of the law. So be ready. If he says something in his opening that is a misstatement of the law, I will entertain that objection. And I, I suggest that you have some legal authority because I'll ask you to approach. And we're doing research as I speak. And if you are right, he misstates the law, I will sustain your objection. And I will tell him to rephrase or to change or to abandon and to not mislead the jury and to misstate the law. I will not let that happen. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. What? You won. Don't misstate the law. I got you. I got a particular statute I'm quoting now. I'm quoting Give me the statute so that my staff attorney can have it all up. So when, if you misstate the law or if they think you misstate the law, I can cross that bridge when I come to it. Absolutely. Florida Statute 777.04, subparagraph 5, subparagraph A, abandonment. Attempted murder, I either shoot and I miss, or for some other reason, she's still alive. She's still alive because he abandoned her. Now, the only reason I bring this up now, the only reason I bring this up now is because it's an affirmative defense as opposed to self-defense, which is not an affirmative defense. Something like insanity is an affirmative defense. I have to tell them ahead of time. And that's all I'm doing right now is re-invoking that so that they will be on notice. You're right. When we get to the charging conference, I... I can tell you where I pulled my language from, and we, we go from there. But right now, it's just about invocation. But, but and, 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 and you're going to argue to me that the abandonment takes away whatever attempt was made up. It forgives the prior attempt. So I'm trying to kill you. An, I decide to stop, yes. and that absolves me of the attempt that I made to kill you. That's absolute, your position. It's an absolute defense of, of attempted murder. Right. It's an right. absolute defense. Abandonment. All right. Well, we want we want suspects who are trying to be you, you see we're, we're getting way I apologize I'm sorry we can't talk at the same time it's my fault and I take full responsibility for that but um, we will flesh this out <coughs> at the charging conference but I would like some authority I'd love to see a case where the affirmative defense of abandonment was used in any attempt attempt murder attempt robbery any attempt type charge I'll look. I didn't know it was going to be an issue because it's right on point on the statute. Okay. I understand. Well, I will read the statute, okay. and again, that's not going to be determined until the evidence is in, and the law says that you have to point to some evidence, <laughs> slight evidence, to support your defense before I can instruct the jury on it. I agree. I'm on another subject? Protocol. How many subjects do you have? Well, as many as I need to be before the trial. A uh, protocol. Uh, I am by myself here. And I'm being tag-teamed 
by two assistant state attorneys. Happens now, all the time. Well, no, I, I would think that asked asked when they argue something that they shouldn't be double teamed. I, 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 I agree. That's there's I no rule that. on that, but absolutely. Um, and the uh, same with objections and the same as we go. Absolutely, no, no crisscrossing or jumping um, objections. Uh, so one, whoever is responsible, for example. For that witness, will make the objections during that witness's testimony. Whoever's doing the opening will make objections during the opening. And for, you know, And so. that's the overlap, Judge. I'm doing the opening, but Ms. O'Connor is handling the abandonment issue. So I apologize. Okay. All right. All right. Anything else, Mr. Marchese? Uh, not at this time. Do we have speakers? I don't know. Did they come I'm in? Unwrap, you know, untangle this mess here, and then I just need to figure out where I can plug this in. Not a problem. My judicial assistant is coming up to assist you. I know nothing about the AV equipment in the courtroom. I'm old fashioned. Yeah. on that issue of abandonment is Long Vol versus State at 919, 914, 914, 914 Southern 2nd, 1098. <clears throat> Carroll, C-A-R-R-O-L-L, -L, versus State. 680. 
680 southern second 1065 There's obviously yeah. such a defense as abandonment, but as to whether it applies to an attempt crime, I think is the issue that we have here. But, but just uh, just read the case law. I'm going to read the case law. I'm going to read the statute that you cited, and at the appropriate time, we're going to have. But you proceed at your own caution in opening statement. Yes, sir, I understand. All right. State ready to proceed? Yes, Judge. Defense ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Let's get the jury. Seated. Everyone else may be seated at this time, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen of the jury, I apologize. 
And I have to catch myself on that. Gentlemen of the jury, good morning and welcome back. Thank you for coming back. It's not like you had a whole lot of uh, choice in the matter, but thank you for being here. Again, we greatly appreciate you and thank you for your very important civic duty and your service with us throughout the course of this trial. The first question that I need to ask you and uh, simply require a show of hands if it is an affirmative answer, was anybody exposed from the time you left the courtroom yesterday and the time you've returned this morning to anything about this case, either through social media, media, discussion, uh, conversation, or any relation to this case? Exposure by show of hands. Let the record reflect there are no hands. Again, thank you very much. I will be required to ask you that after breaks and things like that. And I will, before we break, remind you not to do any of that. I apologize for that, but it is important that I do it. I indicated to you yesterday that throughout the course of the trial, the uh, judge, myself, would be giving you instructions uh, that are required. The beginning instructions are called preliminary instructions. They're not very long. It's only about four pages that I will read to you this morning. They also include how a trial proceeds so you have an idea. I'll give you a heads up. It tells you that the next thing after the instructions are closing arguments, which the attorneys will have an opportunity to give when I'm done with the instructions. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just so that I don't have to scream when I read the instructions, they're written by the Florida Supreme Court. Every word of them is important, and so I read them so that I don't leave anything out. It, in fact, it says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, and I'm going to have to fix that, gentlemen of the jury, you have been selected and sworn as the jury to try the case of State of Florida versus Trevor Stevens Summers. This is a criminal case. Trevor Stephen Summers is charged with attempted murder in the first degree with a weapon, kidnapping, sexual battery by a person 18 or older upon a victim 18 or older, child neglect, grand theft motor vehicle, and violation of domestic violence injunction. The definitions of attempted murder in the first degree with a weapon, kidnapping, kidnapping, sexual battery by a person 18 or older upon a victim 18 or older, child neglect, grand theft motor vehicle, and violation of domestic violence injunction will be explained to you later. The state's charging document, which is called an indictment, is not evidence and is not to be considered by you as any proof of guilt. It is the judge's responsibility to explain the law to you, it is your solemn responsibility to determine if the state proved its accusation beyond a reasonable doubt against Trevor Stephen Summers in accordance with the law that I provide to you. Thus, the province of the jury and the province of the court are well defined and they do not overlap. This is one of the fundamental principles of our system of justice. Before proceeding further, it will be helpful if you understand how a trial is conducted. At the beginning of the trial, the attorneys will have an opportunity, if they wish, to make an opening statement. The opening statement gives the attorneys a chance to tell you what evidence they believe will be presented during the trial. What the lawyers say is not evidence, and you are not to consider it as such. Following the opening statements, Witnesses will be called to testify under oath. They will be examined and cross-examined by the attorneys. Documents and other exhibits also may be produced as evidence. After the evidence has been presented, the attorneys will have the opportunity to make their closing arguments. Following the closing arguments by the attorneys, the court will instruct you on the law applicable to the case. After the final instructions are given, you will then retire to consider your verdict. You should not form any definite or fixed opinion on the merits of the case until you have heard all the evidence, the argument of the lawyers, and the instructions on the law by the judge. Until that time, you should not discuss this case among yourselves. Your verdict must be based solely on the evidence or lack of evidence and the law. I now instruct you not to communicate with anyone, including your fellow jurors, about this case. 
No communication includes no emailing, text messaging, tweeting, blogging, or any other form of communication. You cannot do any research about the case or look up any information about the case. If you become aware of any violation of any of these rules at all, notify court personnel of the violation. During the course of the trial, the court may take recesses and you will be permitted to separate and go about your personal affairs. During these recesses, you must not discuss the case with anyone, nor permit anyone to say anything to you or in your presence about the case. If anyone attempts to say anything to you or in your presence about this case, tell him or her that you are on the jury trying the case and ask that person to stop. If he or she persists, leave that person at once and immediately report the matter to the bailiff who will advise me. All cell phones, computers, tablets, or other types of electronic devices must be turned off while you are in the courtroom. Turned off means that the phone or other electronic device is actually off and not in a silent or vibrating mode. You may use these devices during recesses, but even then, you may not use your cell phone or electronic device to find out any information about the case or communicate with anyone about the case or the people involved in the case. Do not take photographs, video recordings, or audio recordings of the proceedings or of your fellow jurors. After each recess, please double check to make sure your cell phone or electronic device is turned off at the end of the case. While you are deliberating, you must not communicate with anyone outside the jury room. You cannot have in the jury room any cell phones, computers, or other electronic devices. If someone needs to contact you in an emergency, the court can receive messages and deliver them to you without delay. A contact phone number will be provided to you. The case must be tried by you only on the evidence presented during the trial, in your presence, and in the presence of the defendant, the attorneys, and the judge. Jurors must not conduct any investigation of their own. This includes reading newspapers, watching television, or using a computer, cell phone, the internet, any electronic device, or any other means at all to get information related to this case, the people in places, or the people in places involved in the case. This applies whether you are in the courthouse, at home, or anywhere else. You must not visit places mentioned in the trial, or use the internet to look at maps or pictures to see places discussed during the trial. Jurors must not have discussions of any sort with friends or family members about the case or the people and places involved, so do not let even the closest family members make comments to you or ask questions about the trial. In this age of electronic communication, I want to stress again that just as you must not talk about this case face-to-face, -face, you must not talk about this case by using an electronic device. You must not use phones, computers, or other electronic devices to communicate. Do not send or accept any messages related to this case or your jury service. Do not discuss this case or ask for advice by any means at all, including posting information on an internet website, chat room, or blog. What are the reasons for these rules? These rules are imposed because jurors must decide the case without distraction and only on the evidence presented in the courtroom. If you investigate, research, or make inquiries on your own, the trial judge has no way to make sure that the information you obtain is proper for the case. The parties, likewise, have no opportunity to dispute or challenge the accuracy of what you find. That is contrary to our judicial system, which assures every party the right to ask questions about and challenge the evidence being considered against it and to present argument with respect to that evidence. Any independent investigation by a juror unfairly and improperly prevents the parties from having that opportunity our judicial system promises. Any juror who violates these restric restrictions jeopardizes the fairness of these proceedings and a mistrial could result that would require the entire trial process to start over. A mistrial is a tremendous expense and inconvenience to the parties, the court, and the taxpayers. If you violate these rules, you may be held in contempt of court and face sanctions such as serving time in jail, paying a fine, or both. In every criminal proceeding, a defendant has the absolute right to remain silent. 
At no time is it the duty of a defendant to prove his innocence. From the exercise of a defendant's right to remain silent, a jury is not permitted to draw any inference of guilt. And the fact that a defendant did not take the witness stand must not influence your verdict in any manner whatsoever. The attorneys are trained in the rules of evidence and trial procedure, and it is their duty to make all objections that they feel are proper. When an objection is made, you should not speculate on the reason why it is made. Likewise, when an objection is sustained or upheld by me, you must not speculate on what might have occurred had the objection not been sustained, nor what a witness might have said had he or she been permitted to answer. During the trial, it may be necessary to confer with the attorneys out of your hearing to discuss matters that require consideration by me alone. It is impossible to predict when such a conference may be required or how long it will last. When such conferences do occur, they will be conducted so as to consume as little of your time as is necessary for a fair and orderly trial of the case. If you would like to take notes during the trial, you may do so. On the other hand, of course, you are not required to take notes if you do not want to. That will be left up to you individually. You have been provided with a notepad and pen for use if you wish to take notes. Any notes that you take will be for your personal use. However, you should not take them with you from the courtroom. During recesses, the bailiff will take possession of your notes and will return them to you when we reconvene. After you have completed your deliberations, the bailiff will deliver your notes to me. They will be destroyed. No one will ever read your notes. If you do take notes, do not get so involved in the note-taking that you become distracted from the proceedings. Your notes should only be used as aids to your memory. Whether or not you take notes, you should rely on your memory of the evidence, and you should not be unduly influenced by the notes of other jurors. Notes are not entitled to any greater weight than each juror's memory of the evidence. That's all of the instructions. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off and just a couple of things before we get started. Take out those pins and take them for a test drive on your pad. We reuse, we recycle pins. They ultimately run out of ink. I want to make sure that we start off with all of your pins working. And I want to let you know, please do not be shy. If at any time your pin runs out of ink or if you have, you're having trouble finding a pin, perhaps, um, is there an issue with... Yeah, I'm not familiar with... Um, Mr. Balcu, are you uh, not finding it? Yeah, I found it? You found it? All right. Um, thank you. Go ahead and take it for a test drive. Make sure they work. If at any time, if you need a new pin now, um, a deputy of state will get it for you. If at any time during the course of the proceedings your pin runs out of ink, and trust me, it happens, raise your hand, get my attention, get the deputy to your right's attention. He's got a supply of new pins. We'll get to you right away. So um, thank you for that. Uh, at this time, now that it looks like everyone's pin is in working order, I'm going to turn to the state and ask them if they wish to give an opening statement. You may proceed. May it please the court, defense counsel, Mr. Summers, co-counsel, good morning, ladies and late, good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> Between March 11th, of 2017 and March 13th of 2017, Elisa Summers thought she was living out the last few days of her life. She believed that the defendant, Trevor Summers, was going to kill her. And he didn't attempt one time to kill her during those days. He attempted twice. I'm going to take you back to October 16th October of 2016, when Elisa Summers decided that she was going to seek a divorce against the defendant. She moved out of the home, got her own home, was working, purchased a car, and was moving on with her life. She was moving away from the marriage, the marriage that she had been in for the last 16 years with the defendant. And they had five children together. The oldest, Arden Summers, being 14 years of age, and the youngest, Cooper, who was three years old. Elisa Summers, during that time between October and um, March, she obtained a restraining order, specifically in February of 2017. 
just two and a half weeks before the March incidents occurred, she obtained a restraining order, a protective order, where the defendant knew he was not to be near Elisa Summers or her home. But on March 11th of 2017, he ignored that protective order and he proceeded to utilize his 12 year old and 14 year old's feelings about the divorce. They were, they're typical teenagers who were not, they were upset that their parents were gonna get divorced, that their family was gonna change. And he played on their feelings with that and he convinced them to help him get into her home in the early morning hours of March 11th of 2017. The Thursday, the Friday before, March 10th of 2017, Arden Summers, the 14 year old, and Brennan Grady, five and seven years old, were spending the night with Elisa Summers. And the plan was once Elisa and Brennan Grady went to sleep, Arden was going to help her father get into the home so that he could come and talk to Elisa and try to convince her to come back home so their family could be a family once again. There's text messaging that you're going to get to see that occurred between Landon, who was 12, Arden, who was 14, and the defendant that occurred on the evening of March 10th of 2017 with this plan. Questions, are they sleeping yet? Is mom's boyfriend at the house or not? So Landon and the defendant, once three-year-old Cooper fell asleep around midnight, leading into March 11th of 2017, Landon and the defendant left the home while Cooper was left at the defendant's home sleeping. Landon and the defendant proceeded to drive to the area where Lisa Summers lived and parked in a parking lot just down the street from her home. Surveillance footage captures Landon walking down the street towards his mother's home. Surveillance video footage captures the defendant walking down the street, walking towards Elisa Summers' homes that he knew he was not supposed to be there. Shortly thereafter, you see Arden and Landing, walk, Landon walking away from the victim's home. You don't see Trevor Summers walk away from the victim's home. The state submits that the evidence will show Trevor Summers entered the bedroom window that Arden had left open for him. He proceeds to enter Elisa Summers' home while she is sleeping in her bedroom with her five-year-old and seven-year-old. Brennan Grady. And you will see the text messaging that continues between Arden and Landon and their father, the defendant, about what he's doing in the home of Elisa Summers and how he is going to try to wake her up and convince her to come back home. But that's not what happened. You are going to get to hear from Elisa Summers. You are going to hear what happened in that home the early morning hours of March 11th of 2017. You're gonna hear that she woke up to some person she could not see in her dark bedroom. She begins screaming, who is here? Who is in my room? And as soon as she hears the defendant's voice, she knows exactly who it was. She starts throwing things at him and screaming. Brennan Grady are in the bed with her. The defendant takes her feet, pulls her out of the bedroom and down the hallway into the family room. Brennan and Grady are waking up, seeing what's happening. They realize what's happening. They're concerned for their mom. They're crying and upset. And the defendant tells Brennan and Grady to go back in the bedroom. For hours then, the defendant has the victim in her family room. Elisa tries multiple times to run out the front door, and every time the defendant, the defendant overpowers her with his weight and size. She is trying to keep Brennan Grady calm. So every time they yell from the bedroom, Mom, are you okay? Is everything okay? She's like, I'm fine, kids. It's, everything's okay. Because she's worried about 
them. Around 4.20 a.m., you're going to see the defendant's Pacifica minivan come driving by from the parking lot was down the street towards Elisa Summers' home. Arden and Landon are sitting in the minivan from the early morning hours around 12.30 until 4.20 when the minivan is being seen moving towards the victim's home. They're texting their father, you know, and he's texting them back. He's saying, I need more time with her. I need more time. At some point, shortly before 6 a.m., he tells Arden that he needs more time. She needs to come in and get the kids because someone needs to get home to Cooper because he's going to wake up soon, three-year-old, at his house. So you'll see video footage where... 14-year-old Arden drives from her mother's home, leaves around 6 a.m., and is pulling into her father's home at around 6.18 a.m. It's about a 20-minute, 20, 25-minute 20, drive. 14-year-old Arden drives his minivan with Landon in there and Brennan Grady in that vehicle. The children remain at his home that day. There's some text messaging. They're asking, when are you and mom coming home? All the while, the defendant has Elisa Summers tied up in her home, in her bedroom, where he is talking about he's going to leave. He needs to leave. He's going to catch a boat to go to an island. She is hogtied at points. She is tied with Christmas tree lights, tied down to her bed with rope. He would come into the room, leave, and come back. When she would be able to wriggle out at times, he would tie her down with more ropes. You will hear from Elisa Summers. She will take you step by step what happened those hours on March 11th of 2017 in her bedroom. The defendant wanted to get into her phone, her cell phone. She's hogtied and he's trying to get her thumbprint on the phone to unlock it. He would leave the room. She did not know what he was doing. If he left the house, if he just left the room and went into the family room, she didn't know where he was because she was in her bedroom this entire time. At some point, he walks into the bedroom with a look she has never seen, the, has never recognized this look. And in his eyes, he approached her when she is tied onto the bed, grabs a pillow, and puts it over her face. He is standing over the bed takes the pillow and pushes it down on her face when her hands are tied. She then feels him get onto the bed and force his whole weight, pushing that pillow down on her face as she is struggling to breathe, struggling to find a way to take a breath. To the point he pushes so hard and for so long, she loses consciousness. She comes to, and she just feels the pillow laying over her face at that time. She didn't feel any more pressure. And she realizes at that time, she can no longer continue to fight. She's not going to be able to run. She is going to have to do anything and everything to act like she is on his side. She's going to have to change her tune. She's going to have to say, what she says is, I will go with you. I will go with you on that boat. Because she knows if she doesn't, her life is over. So at that point, she makes the decision that she tells him he's going to go. And he's like, are you going to go with me? She says, yes, I'll go with you. He packs her bag, he packs her suitcase. And the plan was 
that they were going to go by his home, say goodbye to the children, get his suitcase, and then they would go for this boat that he said he had down south, lined up to take them to the islands. During these hours that Elisa was held in that house, he doesn't let her go outside. He lets her have some smoke breaks where you'll see in photographs outside a window the cigarette butts are thrown out there. He allows her to take a shower. He watches her in the shower. There are sexual acts that occurred during this entire March 11th through the 13th. There are four sexual acts that occurred, two in Hillsborough, two in Manatee. But the facts and circumstances surrounding those sex acts will show to you that it's anything but consensual. At some point in the evening of March 11th of 2017, roughly around 8.30, the defendant finally responds to his children. I've convinced her she's coming home. We're coming home. I'll be there soon. That's the last text message that the children get. So shortly before 9 p.m., even though Miss Elisa Summers had agreed that she was going to go with him, he had to tie her up. He had to tie her up to get in the car, to get in her car. He didn't have a car there because the children had already taken it to his house. So he takes her keys to her vehicle, puts her in the car, tied up with her hands behind her back with a blanket draped over her so no neighbors would see and puts her in the passenger side of the vehicle. He then drives the both of them towards his home and they stop at a Walgreens. He parks at that Walgreens, enters the Walgreens while Lisa Summers is left in that passenger vehicle. She is able to maneuver her hands that are tied behind her back to open up the passenger door, she jumps out of the car yelling and screaming for help as the blanket falls off the back of her. You will hear that a Walgreens employee, Mr. Crosby, saw this happen. Based upon what he saw, he called 911. He saw the defendant come running out of Walgreens, grab Miss Elisa Summers, and put her back into the passenger side of the vehicle get in the driver's side, and flee the Walgreens. But before the defendant was able to leave, Mr. Crosby got the tag number. And that is what exploded this entire investigation by the Hillsborough County State uh, Sheriff's Office open, that 911 call. From that point, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, from March 11th through March 13th, is conducting an active kidnapping investigation you will hear the number of deputies and detectives and sergeants that were on this case. They had a mobile command station where all the leads, all the tips, all the investigative work that was being done by the sheriff's office was coming back to. They were trying to find Elisa Summers alive. After the Walgreens incident, the defendant was not very happy because now he was not going to get to go say goodbye to the children. He wasn't going to be able to get his suitcase. He takes Elisa Summers a ways down the road, out of the car, gets mad at her, ties her then to the seat with the rope, and proceeds to drive around in her vehicle for quite some time, heading south. They proceed down to Manatee County, where they remain in a secluded area in a field underneath a tree in order to not be located by law enforcement for the night of March 11th of 2017. The defendant had taken her out of the vehicle at one point and said he was going to cut her, the ropes that had uh, were tied behind, had her hands tied behind her back. But by accident, he, he cut her wrist. You're going to see the injury to Miss Summer's wrist. You're going to see the blood that was left behind from that. 
but he didn't cut those ropes off. She was still bound with her hands behind her back as she was bleeding on March 11th of 2017. She had already tried to run at that point at the Walgreens. She was not successful. So in this secluded area, she wasn't able to run. Ms. Summers will tell you what the defendant told her if she tried to run. That night on March 11th of 2017, they stayed in that vehicle. Miss, the defendant, he took a nap. Miss Summers, she didn't sleep. All next day, March 12th of 2017, that vehicle and them remained in Manatee County, laying low to not be discovered by law enforcement. Finally, on March 13th of 2017, they were running out of food and water. So those early morning hours, they go to McDonald's and sit go. You will see video footage from them at those two places. You will hear what is going on and where Elisa Summers is when the defendant goes into sit go. He makes her be in the third row of the vehicle so he doesn't have another incident like what happened at the Walgreens. You'll see how his behavior is in that sitco video. Shortly thereafter, they proceed to Anna Maria Island, where he is telling her, we need to look for a certain color flag. That's where this safe house is gonna be for this boat that you have agreed to go on with me. They drive around, they're not able to find the color of the flag that he told her, but he knows where this other safe house is gonna be in Little Harbor, the Ruskin area. And when they're over in the Little Harbor area, they're continuing to talk and he's like, you're really gonna go with me? And she says, well, I would really rather stay here with the children, she's gonna test the waters. Can she maybe convince him? I'm not, she tells him, I'm not, I promise, if you let me stay with the children, I will not call the police. I promise you I will not call the police. So he starts considering letting that happen, or so he tells her. He writes letters in the back of the victim's vehicle, letters that you will get to see, a confession letter of what took place on March 11th, 2017 at her home writes a surrender of his parental rights, writes letters that Ms. Summers is to get his car, the money in his bank account, and his home, and a letter that he wrote to his children. A letter that he wrote before the second attempted homicide incident. You will get to see that letter. You will get to make the determination what kind of letter that was. At some point when they are in the Ruskin, Har Ruskin Little Harbor area, Elisa Summers makes a comment when the defendant says he's going to write a letter to his parents. And she makes a comment, why would you do that when they are partly involved? Because she had no idea that her 14-year-old drove herself and her three siblings home the early morning hours of March 11th. The defendant had told her that his parents had picked the children up. And at that point, the defendant gets mad that Elisa Summers makes that comment. He takes the rope that she was tied up with and proceeds to pull it around her neck. Elisa Summers, while her hands are tied, she's able to stop it as he is trying to pull that rope and strangle her around her neck. The second attempted first degree murder charge. You're gonna get to see shortly thereafter what Elisa Summers' neck looked like. You're gonna get to make the determination what was happening in the vehicle at that time. While the defendant has this rope around Elisa Summers' neck, he notices what he thinks is an un undercover marked unit. He jumps into the front seat and begins to drive a ways down the road to a home that is on stilts and pulls in underneath their carport. He tells Elisa, we've been spotted, the law enforcement's gonna be here soon. He then takes a razor blade, the razor blade that he had cut her wrist with, 
on March 11th of 2017 and says, I'm going to lay my life down for you. And he begins to cut his neck as law enforcement surround the vehicle, pull Elisa Summers alive from that vehicle, pull the defendant from the vehicle, place him down on the ground, and detain him while they provide aid to his neck. Elisa Summers is in shock, is grateful that she has been found. She has just been through Lord only knows what. She provides an interview with law enforcement. She is photographed. Items are taken from her. Swabs are taken from her. She is taken to the crisis center where a sexual assault exam, a sex bat kit, a rape kit is performed on her. She shows law enforcement where pieces of evidence were disposed of by the defendant. The state would submit to you that that is all evidence that corroborates what Elisa Summers is going to tell you on the witness stand. The defendant is taken to Tampa General Hospital where he receives treatment for his self-inflicted wound. And at that hospital, he is read as Miranda writes and he admits some of the incidents that occurred between March 11th and March 13th. You will get to hear that recording and the admissions that the defendant makes on that recording. The admissions like he allowed Arden to let him in to Elisa Summers' home the early morning hours of March 11th of 2017. The admission that he was trying to suffocate Elisa Summers with a pillow. She was mouthing off and I told her I could end this right now. Well, I was just being an ass and you know, pretending like I could suffocate her. Question, but she is tied up at this point? Yeah, she's tied up. His admission that he walked into Walgreens and when he saw her running around in the parking lot, he had to go grab her and put her back in the car. And he thought that a, a, a Walgreens employee saw him and was probably calling 911. You'll hear him admit to the writings that he made in the car. The writings, the confession letter, the writings to his children. You'll hear him admit that he knew he lied to Elisa Summers about who drove the children home because he knew Elisa Summers would freak out that her 14-year-old daughter drove her and her siblings home. But what he told law enforcement was he didn't do this. He wasn't mad because she was on dating websites or moving on with her life. That's not why he did this. He did it because he was mad she didn't tell him the truth about it. Ladies and gentlemen, the law that you are to follow in this case is gonna come from your honor. It's not gonna come from me. It's not gonna come from defense counsel. So at the conclusion of this case, the law you are to follow is the law in which the judge is going to instruct you. The evidence in this case is overwhelming. The evidence will come from the testimony from that witness stand right there. The exhibits that are introduced in this trial and the state is confident that at the conclusion of this case, you will find the defendant guilty as to all charges. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Marchese, does the defense wish to give an opening statement this time? May it please the court. I'm court reporter, Ms. Crook, Bailey, Ms. Johnson, Ms. O'Connor, Mr. Summers, gentlemen of the jury. You are performing 
a most important civic duty and privilege being here. We need you here. The next five days will be transformative to you, both in the legal system to hopefully appreciate what our judicial system is and the freedoms that we enjoy. And also, you're going to leave with a feeling of despair in hearing this very tragic story about a family that fell apart. As you hear, these folks were married for 16 years. These folks had five children, ranging from teenagers, 14-year-olds, down to a toddler, three years old, five children. The marriage was falling apart. The parties were separating. But there was nothing that said that the divorce was acrimonious. Didn't appear that they were fighting over anything. Children, property, assets. And they had been estranged for a while. It is true that there was an injunction against Mr. Summers. But there was also an injunction against Mrs. Summers. Now, we trust in the collective wisdom of the jury, as we discussed on Void Iyer. And again, you all promise that as we sit here today, Mr. Summers enjoys the presumption of innocence which you give him. The story that Ms. Johnson gave you is a story. It is the state's theory of what happened. A lot of it is true, a lot of it is also verified by Mr. Summers when he makes a statement. But we also have to follow the law. Look at the charges that are against him and see if the facts that you hear from that witness stand match up with the law as you're going to get instructed from the court. He's charged with attempted murder you heard some information, not evidence. You heard some story about how that was happening. How did it end? You heard some statements about crimes of kidnapping. When exactly that occurred. And what was the motive of the kidnapping? What was the purpose of the kidnapping? If there was a kidnapping. There was sexual activity. Whether you call it sexual assault is depends again, is it a crime? What happened in that situation? It's charged with grand theft, stealing the automobile. It didn't seem that that was actually the motive for all of this. It's charged with child neglect. I would say that these poor children that have to go through these tumultuous divorces and then when situations get out of hand, the children always suffer. They have to come in today and testify to, they go through this event that happened between them. There are some inconsistencies through all of this. You will see, they, there are times, she, she says, the testimony from Mrs. Summers will be that she was tied up, that she couldn't get away, that she was forced, that she had no alternative. But there's some inconsistencies. You will see a McDonald's video where she's not tied up, where she's assisting, mixing the ketchup, the mustard, getting things together. When you get to the sexual assault, you, you have to make some decisions about the distinctions between consent and acquiescence. Most certainly an individual who is being abducted and decides to do anything to stay alive, that would be acquiescence and I would agree that that's not, that's not consent. But the question is, is that the situation in this They weren't divorced yet. She was estranged from him. She was living in her own house. He was living in his house. 
It appears that they were exchanging the children without any difficulty. And as I said before, it didn't appear that there was any acrimonious in the divorce itself. So I wonder what was the motivating factor for all of this. And then we've got a period of time, three days, where they're in the car. Only them. There's a period of time where they have the Walgreens incident. And we talk about that, the circumstances surrounding that. And yes, I agree. This is not a police-generated case. It's not where the police went out and got search warrants or wiretaps, like in the drug cases or racketeering cases, things like that. The police got a call from 911, and they followed through on a 911 call looking for Dr. So the things that the police did to look and find these people, we have no quarrel with. But I would then suggest Mr. Summers is in the hospital. You will hear that he had cut himself. He was in the hospital. You have to say, what were the circumstances in that? And then a detective came in and got an interview, a taped interview. You will see some photographs compared against through the tape. A picture's worth a thousand words. When you hear the thousand words, you have to question, why is this being made? What is this being made? What is the circumstances surrounding this? Can this be trusted? Is this trustworthy? And then you're going to have a balancing act with a bunch of different competing theories, which is why we're here. If we all agreed on everything, we wouldn't have a trial. Traffic accident cases, somebody says the light was red, red somebody else says the light was green. You have to decide what the facts were. And you're to do so with the rules that you have been given. Mr. Summers, as a citizen, has the right constitutional protection to be examined again to look at this again through the eyes of the jury of his peers citizens as yourself not law enforcement not the state attorney's office not Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office not the judge he's decided by a jury of his peers which is what we're doing and that means if you keep an open mind if you wait till the end of all the evidence and wait for your deliberations with the collective wisdom of all the other jurors, and you question, is this right? You will be told you can believe everything a witness says, you can believe most of what a witness says, you can believe some of what a witness says, you can believe none of what a witness says. And that applies both for all of the state witnesses and it also applies for Mr. Summers should he decide to take the stand. That's his decision. We've already said and you've heard from the court that if he decides not to take the stand, you're not to draw any inference from it. That is his privilege and constitutional right to do so. And that you've promised that you will judge the case only from what you hear on the witness stand. When you do that, I believe as you go through each of these crimes, I believe the evidence will show that he is not guilty of the crimes of attempted murder, kidnapping, grand theft. The child neglect charges, I will leave for you to decide. Again, it was so sad of the story to have the children in the middle of all of this from both sides. But we want to make sure that you Keep your honor that you have oath as a juror, all the admonitions from the court, not to talk to anybody about this, to listen only from the evidence of the witness stand, to talk amongst yourselves, gather the facts, put the facts together with the law, make a conclusion if a crime was committed, what crime that was. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Marchese. Ladies and gentlemen, I usually take our morning break at 10.30 since it is 10.20. I'm going to go ahead and take our morning break a little bit early before I allow the state to call their first witness. Please do not discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Please do not do any research related to the case. We'll take about a 15-minute break. All rise for the jury.
uh, morning again to everyone. So, hope everyone enjoyed the break. And uh, we decided, and the state agreed before the break, that we were going to bring number 60, seated in seat number 6, Eric, uh, juror number 60, into the uh, courtroom to inquire about whether he saw anything. Um, Mr. Marchese, are you all right with that being the question? When he was being brought back this morning by the bailiff, did he see anything? And then obviously, if he says, I saw something, what did you see? Yeah, I saw the defendant. Okay, well, what did you see about the defendant? I mean, I need to know, did he see him in orange? Did he see chains? All right. State, uh, you agree? Yes, sir. All right. I don't want to put the attorneys in the position of having to ask questions of a juror. So I'll ask the questions. I will then excuse the juror. If for some reason I left something out that you wish me to ask, I may bring them back and, and ask them that. All right, so let's bring in number six. Not a problem. Okay. And I, I told them that we would go and break for lunch around 12. I don't mind if, you know, we go a little bit past that, but um, hopefully 12, 15 at the latest for lunch. I just have a couple brief questions uh, of you. You can go ahead and uh, be seated. Juror is seated. Everyone else may be seated at this time. I apologize to you. I don't mean to embarrass you by bringing you into the courtroom by yourself, and you certainly haven't done anything wrong. I just have a question of you related to when you came back or were brought back um, this morning into the courtroom when you originally arrived, and the deputy who was walking you in opened the door and then had to close the door. Did you see anything in, inside of the door when it was opened? Yes, I did. What did you see? Three of the defendant. Okay. Um, could you see what he was wearing? Yes, I could. What was he wearing? Uh, orange jumpsuit. Okay. Could you see anything else? No. All right. Have you had a discussion with anyone else in the on the jury about what you saw? No. Did what you saw affect your ability to be fair, continue to be fair and impartial in this case in any way? No, it will not. All right. I'm going to instruct you specifically at this time not to at any time now or during deliberations to discuss with anyone else what you saw. Understood. All right. Um, thank you. All rise for the juror. Satisfied. No one go forward. He says it doesn't affect him, and won't say anything else. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm know, satisfied. My biggest concern, but I will also assure you that there is case law that says the simple sighting of the defendant in orange or in chains or shackles is not in and of itself enough. So uh, I appreciate uh, that, and I think state. Was there anything else you wanted me to inquire about, or anything? That you want to state? Nothing from the state. All right, excellent. Thank you all. You issue? Yes. It's been resolved. Excellent. You ready to call your first witness? Yes, Your Honor. You ready for the jury? Yes. Mr. Marchese, you ready for the jury? The defense stands ready for trial. Let's get the jury.
jury is present and seated. Everyone else may be seated at this time. Gentlemen of the jury, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your break. My, uh, you dropped your pen. It's, <laughs> there you go. Uh, first question to you, and probably only question to you, is did any of you have any exposure to anything about this case outside of the courtroom during the last break? No hands. Let the record reflect there are no hands. Thank you, gentlemen, again. And we are now going to turn to the state and ask them to please call their first witness. State calls Randall Crosby. Randall Crosby. <laughs> Crosby, good morning and welcome, sir. If you'll come forward to be sworn wherever you're comfortable, if you'll face me and raise your right hand, please. Thank you. Do you swear, do you swear or affirm any testimony you give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. If you'll follow the bailiff now to the ramp that leads up to the witness chair, please watch your step. Go ahead, have a seat, make yourself comfortable. That microphone in front of you is fully adjustable, and it is on. You may proceed. Good morning, Mr. Crosby. Good morning. Can you please state your first and your last name, spelling your last name for me, please? Yes, it's Randall Crosby, and that's C-R-O-S-B-Y. And if I can just ask you to speak up a little bit louder, it's hard, a little hard for me to hear you, so I want to make okay. sure everybody can hear you. Um, can you tell me where you're currently employed? Uh, carrier. And what do you do for them? I'm an engineer. And what kind of engineer are you? Uh, chemical engineer. And where were you employed in March of 2017? Walgreens. Uh, what Walgreens were you uh, employed at? Fishhawk. And uh, is that located in Hillsborough County? It is. What were your job duties there? Um, I worked back and forth between the pharmacy and the front end, so dealing with customer service issues and uh, prescriptions. And ultimately, was there an incident that had occurred on the um, night hours of March 11th of 2017 that ultimately led you uh, to place a call to law enforcement? Yes. Can you tell me where you were when you made um, some initial observations? I was standing out in front of the store. And uh, what were you doing out there? I believe I was on my phone on, on my break. And um, what observations did you make that ultimately led you to call law enforcement? Uh, I'd seen and heard a woman uh, running and screaming in the parking lot. Did you make any observations of her, what she was wearing, what she looked like? Yes. What did you see? Uh, I'd seen she initially had like a blanket over her shoulders. And uh, she was running away, the blanket fell off, and I saw her hands were bound behind her back somehow. Um, could you see how her hands were bound behind her back? No. Did you make any other observation of her that you recall? Not that I recall. Was she running, um, can you tell me, um, describe for me um, where you were standing outside your Walgreens? I was just outside the front door to the left, I believe. And was this female running towards you or away from you? Away from me. Did you see where she had come from? I did not. Could you make out what she was yelling? Yes. And what did she say? Uh, I believe it was something to the effect of, like, help, yes. help, help, call the police. Hold on, wait, I'm sorry, hold yep, on sorry. for a second.
question. What was that female yelling? And uh, it's, uh, something to the effect of help, 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 call the police. Um, what did you observe? <coughs> what did you observe next? Uh, a man was chasing after her. Um, do you recall anything about this man? What he was wearing, what he looked like? Yes. And what do you recall? Uh, I gave a description of the events to the police at the time. I don't recall what he was wearing at the, okay. at the moment. Um, and did um, that individual um, run towards this female? Yes. Did you see where he came from? No. And um, did this male that you that you saw, um, what did he do when he was running towards the female? Uh, he caught up to her and uh, grabbed her, kind of wrestled her back to the ground. I'm sorry, to where? To the ground. Okay. Did they fall down on the ground? Uh, I don't recall. And what happened next? Uh, he then took the woman uh, and brought her back to a vehicle. And uh, do you recall what kind of vehicle it was or anything about the vehicle? It was a dark Saturn. Was it a sedan style car or an SUV? Like an SUV. And um, when the male was walking the female to the vehicle, were they walking away from you or towards you? Towards me. And how well lit is your Walgreens? It's pretty well lit. <clears throat> um, how far away were you from um, this interaction that you observed? Not a good judge of distance, but it was close enough that I could make out the license plate on the car and the features of the people at the time. When did you make the observations of the license plate? Uh, while I was on the phone with dispatch. <clears throat> when um, you saw the male take the female back to the vehicle, um, what side of the vehicle did the female get in? The passenger side. And did she do that on her own? I was on the driver's side of the vehicle. I couldn't see. And uh, the male, what side of the vehicle did he get in? Uh, he walked around the back side of the vehicle and got in the driver's side. Was that after the female was placed into the vehicle? Yes. Did the vehicle, what happened to the vehicle then? Uh, once they were both back in the vehicle, the vehicle left the parking lot. And you stated that you were able to see the vehicle tag? Yes. Did you do, um, did you contact law enforcement then? I contacted law enforcement uh, shortly after seeing uh, the woman running from the vehicle. And uh, how did you contact law enforcement? By phone. Did you call 911? Yes. Mr. Crosby, I'm showing you what's been pre-marked as State's Exhibit C for identification purposes. Do you recognize this disc? Yes. And how is it that you recognize it? Uh, it was shown to me previously. Uh, are these your initials here on this disc? Yes. And does it fairly and accurately depict the 911 call that you placed on March 11th of 2017 regarding the incidents that you just discussed? Yes. State offers an evidence State's Exhibit C. Any objection? No objection. State C will be admitted. Permission to publish. You may publish. Saturday, March. 11 2017 2107 and 16 seconds <laughs> Oh, 
kind of vehicle are you in? Uh, it's a blue SUV. Looks like an Enclave. Can't be sure though. It's uh, kind of tight. It look like it. The um, trying to get the license plate. Looks like GLH M32. It's a dark, dark blue SUV. Uh, guys, old lecture, James. Are they still there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Are they still there? Uh, he's falling out right now. I'll let you know what direction he goes. Blue Saturn, it's not a Buick. Uh, he's heading out the back. Uh, let me see if he goes under the neighborhood or if he's young. Yes. Did you provide them similar information which you provided in the 911 call? Yes. For 
motion to approach the witness, Judge. You may. <coughs> Mr. Crosby, I'm showing you what's been pre marked as State's Exhibit D, Composite 1 through 5. Have you previously looked at these photographs prior to today? Yes. And do they fairly and accurately depict the Walgreens and um, the item that was left behind or that fell off of the female when she was running away from the vehicle? Yes. State offers into evidence State's Exhibit D, Composite 1 through 5. Any objection? No objection. State's D, Composite 1 through 5 is admitted at this time. Permission to publish? You may publish it to the jury. Publishing D2. Mr. Crosby, can you see what is up on the screen there? Yes. Can you tell me what we're looking at here? It's the blanket that was dropped on the ground. Is the parking spot that that the vehicle, um, the this dark Saturn SUV was parked in, is that parking spot located or captured within this photograph? I don't believe it is. Uh, it was somewhere to the left of that. Okay. To the left, meaning over on, on this side, to the left side of the photograph? Yes, correct. States Exhibit D3 Publishing. Is this the front of the Walgreens? Yes. With the blanket captured in the bottom of the photograph? Yes. Can you please tell me where you were standing when you first made these initial observations? Were you on the side with the red box or on the opposite side? I was on the side towards the red box. Okay, so when you exited the Walgreens, it was on your left. Is that correct, the right of the photograph? Correct. Publishing D5. Can you tell me what we're looking at here? Uh, it looks like a, or I'm sorry, it is a aerial photo of the Walgreens. This is your Walgreens, is that yes, correct? Yes, correct. Um, and if in the um, right middle of the photograph is this the entrance to the Walgreens yes and this little red um, circle here is that where the red box is located uh, it's on that side yes and so you were standing on this side when you first made your observations is that correct correct can you please point to where the vehicle was parked uh, yes you just want me to judge can I ask the witness to please stand up he absolutely can. He can step down um, and approach the screen. Absolutely. Uh, the vehicle is parked somewhere right here. So towards the top center of the photograph? Right, right there. Now, does Walgreens have uh, outside surveillance footage as well as inside? Uh, yes. Where are the outside cameras located? Uh, there's one camera on this corner. This direction, another camera on this corner facing this direction. It's an entrance camera right here facing the door. Your Honor, I'm going to ask the witness to speak up a little louder. I'm having trouble okay. hearing yeah. him. All right, if you can speak up a little louder, the um, defense is having trouble hearing you. So I'm going to, the um, one camera is towards the um, back side of the, of the uh, building, and the other camera is located in the um, the right front of the building? Correct. Um, and so the area in which the um, vehicle was parked, that um, area does not have a camera pointing to it. Is that fair to say? Not one that captures the area very well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. You can sit down. video surveillance from Walgreens? Uh, I believe they did.
Mr. Crosby, I'm showing you what's been um, pre-marked as State's Exhibit D for identification purposes. Do you recognize this disc? Yes, I do. And are your initials on this disc? Yes. And have you had an opportunity to review this video? Yes. Uh, is it fairly and accurately depict um, you on the video the evening of March 11th of 2017 inside the Walgreens as well as just outside the Walgreens when you're on the phone call with 911? Yes. State offers an evidence states exhibit D. Any objection? Yes, you may. Ruled. You may publish. <coughs> oh, I, if I didn't say it, it's admitted. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Crosby, before I open up um, this video, on the 911 call, your call was placed at 9.07 p.m., is that correct? That sounds right. Mr. Crosby, um, there are three different camera angles um, located within this piece of evidence. One that is titled front entrance, one titled outside camera one, and the other uh, noted outside camera two. The front entrance one, that is um, self-explanatory, that is, I assume, the front entrance camera that depicts people en entering and exiting the Walgreens? Correct. Looking at camera one and camera two, can you tell me which one or where on this overview of the Walgreens, which one is camera one and which one is camera two? So I'm pointing to the back left of the um, Walgreens. Do you know if that was camera one or camera two? Uh, that is camera one. And the fright front right um, camera on that corner, is that camera? Camera two. Camera two. <clears throat> so going back to the video, we have a timestamp at 2100 hours. That is 9 p.m. Is that correct? Correct.
I can ask you to concentrate on the front entrance camera angle at this point. Is that individual walking out of the store in all black? That is me. I'm sorry, I need you to speak up loud. I'm sorry, that's me. Okay. Is that, um, what were you doing at that point? I was heading out for my break. to 904. Directing your attention to camera two, that vehicle that just came down at the bottom camera is making that turn. Are you able to say whether or not the dark SUV Saturn that you saw, which side they entered on, whether it was the entrance near camera one or camera two? It was the entrance on camera two. I'm sorry? It was the entrance on camera two. Okay, was that the video footage that we are just observing now? Yes. That made the left turn, or is it this vehicle that we see now? Uh, the vehicle that made the left turn. Okay. Moving along to 906. Do you recall, looking at the front entrance video, do you recall seeing this individual enter the store? Uh, no, I did not uh, observe that. Do you recall seeing that individual exit the store? Uh, yes. Did you make observations of him that you described earlier? Yes. Is that the individual that you observed make contact with the female and put her back in the SUV? Yes. When you made observations of him, was he running outside the store? Yes. At 9.07, now that we see um, that door open on the front entrance, is that uh, you 
on your phone at that time? Yes. Is this when you are providing the information to law enforcement? Yes. At 90904, I'm going to ask you to look at camera 2 or 210904. is that individual running through the parking lot? That's me. And was that um, when we were hearing the loud kind of brushing noise on the 911 call when you were looking to try to see the direction the vehicle went in? Yes. Now moving along to 2112. Drawing your attention to the front entrance camera. Is that you returning uh, into the store after you had completed your 911 call? Yes. And then is that you on camera exiting? Correct. At uh, 2115. And yes. did law enforcement arrive soon thereafter? Yes. When law enforcement conducted an interview of you, um, did they ask you whether or not you would be able to identify the person, the man, that you made the ob observations of? Yes. And did you have to respond down to the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office to um, make or attempt to make an identification? Yes, I did. Um, were you shown what is called a photo pack by law enforcement? Yes, I was. Were you provided instructions uh, prior to looking at any photographs? Yes, I was. Judge, may I, have a, uh, may I approach the witness? You may.
Mr. Crosby, I'm showing you within the pre-marked as state's exhibit E for identification purposes. Have you previously looked at this exhibit? Yes, I have. And is it a fair and accurate copy of the photo pack that you were shown by law enforcement on March 12th of 2017 at 3.12 a.m.? Yes, it was. And on this instruction sheet is your signature on this um, form? Yes, it is. And can you please show me where that signature is? Uh, right there. On the witness signature? Correct. Okay. And is this time, March 12th, 2017 at 3.12 a.m., the time that you viewed this photo pack? It was. And did law enforcement, or uh, state, strike that, did law enforcement read the instructions to you prior to providing you the photographs? Yes, they did. Did they tell you that the person that you saw on that night was in fact in this, or did they tell you that that person may or may not be in that photo pack? I, I don't recall. Okay. But they read the instructions that were on the front form that you signed? Yes. Were you pressured or um, did any threat made on you in order for you to make an identification in this photo pack? No. Um, did you have an accurate amount of time, the time that you needed to view the photo pack? Yes, I did. Were you able to pick an individual out in the photo pack? Yes. Did you make markings on the back of that photograph of the person that you chose? Yes, I did. And did you mark the back of that photograph with your um, signature and the date? Yes, I did. That person that you picked out in the photo pack, do you see that person here in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Can you please point to him and tell me what color he's wearing? Uh, yes, it's the gentleman in the gray shirt. Please let the record reflect he's identified the defendant. Did you know the defendant prior to seeing him uh, at, their, at your Walgreens the night of March 11th of 2017? No. Did you know the female that was running from the vehicle yelling for help with her hands tied behind her back? No, I did not. Do not. Judge, may I have a moment? You may. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Crosby. Good, morning. Good afternoon. We've never met, have we? No, we have not. Uh, at the time in 2017, you were working full-time at Walgreens? I believe so, yes. And were you in school? Yes, I was. Uh, engineering school? Yes. At the time. How long had you been working that day or that night before this incident happened? Uh, I don't recall now. Well, had you just gotten to work, or was it towards the end of your shift? I, I don't recall. My schedule was all over the place due to school, so I could have showed up at 8 o'clock that night, or I could have been there at 12. Uh, I could have gotten there at lunch. I, I don't remember. You don't remember? I don't Do remember. Do you have an independent recollection of this whole event? Yes. Okay. But not in relation to how long you had been at work before this incident happened? Yes. Did you have told the police before that you did not see Mr. Summers go into the Walgreens? I don't recall what I. Do you recall seeing that. him? Wait, 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 don't cut him off. Oh, I'm sorry. The court reporter is having trouble. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks, Don. Go, go ahead and complete your sentence. I just said I don't recall uh, giving a specific statement about that. Okay. And, and so, as we sit here today, can you tell us whether you know for a fact? From your own memory, not from watching from the video, whether Mr. Summers went into the Walker. Uh, no, I cannot. How far away were you from the vehicle? Uh, like I said, I'm not a good judge of distance, but 
we saw the aerial photo from above. I'm having some trouble with you, Mr. Crosby. Could you please speak up? Yes, uh, I said I'm not a very good judge of distance, uh, yeah. so I couldn't quantify it, but we saw the photo from above where I was standing in relation to the parking lot. I mean, in uh, relation you mentioned to before event. something maybe, um, how, how far can you give me an estimate of feet, how far away you were from the vehicle? I wouldn't want to try to quantify it. It, it would just be speculation, uh, 30 feet, 40 feet, 100 feet. All right, very good. And it's at night? It was at night, yes. Uh, and you say the lighting was good? Yes. So you could see the tag of the car? Yes. Uh, do you agree that you kind of misidentified the car at first? Uh, initially, yes. Cool. Was there any way you feel that you could have offered assistance to, go to try to help? Uh, as far as what? What are you suggesting? Well, uh, you saw someone that you say is being grabbed and pushed in the car. Uh, did you try to go to help to, to save her from being put in the car? No, I did not. Uh, how come? Uh, it's not... Uh, that's not something I'm trained for. When you see uh, her get out, you see the blue blanket on her? Yes. Do you see the blue blanket fall off? Yes. Okay. Were you able to see her, her hands while the blanket was on her? I could not, no. Were you able to see her hands when the blanket fell off of her? Yes, I could. And were they bound? Yes. And can you tell us what? They were bound with? Do you know? I cannot, no. Uh, I mean, could you see a rope or a stream? Could you see what was tying her? Uh, I could not see what was binding her hands, no. So what you saw was her hands behind, behind her back or in front of her? Behind her back. So that's what you saw, her hands behind her back? Correct. Did you hear any conversation between the two men, the man and the, and the lady, when he got to her in the parking lot, when he confronted the parking lot? I did not hear it, no. Uh, did you hear her say anything then? Was she screaming at that time? I don't recall. Would you agree that he did not pick her up and throw her over his shoulders to get her back to the car? Yes. The original call uh, came at 9.07 when you make the call, and then you did the photo line up at 3 o'clock in the morning? Correct. So you were at Walgreens this entire time? No, I was not. What happened? Uh, once my shift was over, I went home. And then how did you meet up back with the police? Uh, one of the, I don't know if it was a detective or an officer, um, one of them called me and asked me to come to the station to do the photo lineup, <clears throat> or the photo pack, whatever it's called. Now, I've got your statement here that you said that it looks like her hands were tied. At least that was on the 911 call, right? Do you agree with that statement that you made a 911 call? Yes. But today you're convinced that her hands were tied. Oh, I've just never seen someone run with their hands behind their back in that fashion. It's so, so I stand by the statement that it appears her hands were bound behind her back. You're standing by the statement that it appears. I'm, I'm, the notes that I wrote was that it looks like her hands were tied. Looks like, appears. It's picking at words, in my opinion. I think you made a statement tonight that they that she that they wrestled to the ground. You yes. made that statement here. Yes. Do you recall, I don't recall reading that in any police report or anywhere else where you made a statement that they wrestled to the ground? Do you recall ever making that statement to police before? Uh, I have a written statement. I'd be happy to review. But do you recall ever telling the police that they wrestled to the ground? Uh, 
I don't recall now. Did you see a weapon on the gentleman at all? I did not. Did you see the car speed off? I saw it leave the parking lot. You saw it leave? Yes. I asked that. I asked, did you see the car speed off? That's a very vague statement. Wouldn't you be able to clarify? Well, sure. Did they uh, spin the tires, or rub the tires, have the tires burning, screeching out? I don't think they did, but uh, no, I don't recall that. There's a moment when uh, the gentleman confronts the lady who's in the parking lot and then gets her back to the car. You already said that you did not see that he didn't throw her over his shoulder and walk her there. Would you say he forcibly brought her back to the car? That was the impression that I got at the time. And how so, forcibly? I mean, what gives you that impression? What was he doing? Was he hitting her? Uh, well, the previous screaming was a little, the previous screaming was a giveaway. Well, the screaming before he ever came out. Correct. All right, but I'm talking about specifically when he is there with her. She wasn't screaming then, correct? Correct. All, the entire time getting back into the car, you did not hear anything else from her, correct? I don't know what might have been said or done or... Well, did you hear anything? I didn't, but okay. not from that distance. Okay. And then, did it appear that she was going back to the car voluntarily or cooperating to get back into the car? I think that is very speculative for me to comment on. Well, you, but you commented on it before. Uh, and the deposition taken, you, uh, page eight, line seven. May I approach the witness to see if it refreshes his recollection? Judge, can you approach? Yeah, approach, absolutely.
you ever been involved in anything like this before? Ever called 911 for anything? No, I have not. Judge? I'll allow it. Overruled. Yeah. Well, he's already answered. Is there security at Walgreens? No, there is not. You don't have a <coughs> off-duty guard or something there to call and take? No, we do not. How long did it take law enforcement to come when you made the 911 call? I don't recall. It was on the sc uh, scale of minutes. You said you've been able to identify him. Would you be able to identify the female? Yes. Have you ever met her? I think she came to the Walgreens one time after. She came but to prior, the Walgreens after? But prior to the... Did she speak with you? Yes. Was that in connection to this case? Uh, she had come to the Walgreens to say thank you. And that was the she extent came of to Walgreens to talk to you about to, what you did in this case? To say thank you for calling. Yeah, and that was the extent of our conversation. Did you say anything to her? You're welcome. That was it? I believe so, yeah. I Any don't, other mention of Mr. Summers or the event? No. Go for the question. Redirect, Ms. Johnson. Mr. Crosby, you were questioned about why you didn't run and try to stop the defendant from putting the victim back in the vehicle before taking off from the Walgreens. Did you know whether or not he had a gun in his pocket? No. Objection. Speculative. That's overruled. Um, overruled. Allow him to answer the question. No, I did not. Did you know whether or not he had a weapon on him? No, I did not. And you stated that Ms. Summers had approached you and thanked you for calling 911. Were you aware that when you called 911, law enforcement was not currently investigating the crimes that had occurred just prior to the arrival at Walgreens? Objection. There's no way this witness would know that information. Hold on. Let's move on. Nothing further, Judge. All right. May this witness be excused or subject to recall? The state has no objection to him being excused. Uh, defense, any objection to him being excused as a witness at this time? Uh, no objection. He can be excused. All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. You may be excused as a witness at this time. Let me have the attorneys approach briefly. Good morning and welcome, sir. 
you'll come forward to be sworn as a witness if you'll stand right there and raise your right hand. Face me and raise your right hand. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm any testimony you give in this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God? Yes. Thank you. If you'll follow the bailiff now to the ramp that leads up to the witness chair, please watch your step. When you get to the chair, go ahead, have a seat, make yourself comfortable. That microphone in front of you is fully adjustable. You may proceed, Ms. O'Connor. Thank you, Judge. Uh, sir, can you please state your name, spelling your last name for the record? David Chesla, C-I-E-S-L-A. And, sir, where are you employed? Right now I work for UC Health in Loveland, Colorado. And what do you do for UC Health? I am a surgeon and a trauma medical director at uh, Medical Center of the Rockies in Loveland. Can you please explain your educational background to the jury? Uh, my education um, after high school was four years of college at the University of Colorado, followed by a year of postgraduate research in uh, California, followed by four years of medical school, one year of graduate school, five years of surgery residency, two years of surgery research, and a year of specialized surgical critical care training. All of that was done at the University of Colorado. And are you still uh, up to date as far as your licensing for being a medical doctor? I'm licensed in Florida and Colorado. Back in March of 2017, were you working at a different facility than where you currently work? Yes, I was working at Tampa General Hospital. And what role did you have at Tampa General Hospital in March of 2017? So I worked for the University of South Florida uh, in their medical practice group. Um, I was the chief of the division of trauma acute care surgery. And my assignment was as faculty at Tampa General Hospital and the medical director of the trauma program. So as a employee of USF working at Tampa General Hospital and being the medical director of trauma, what did you do specifically? Uh, my job was mostly split into sort of missions. So as an act in an academic practice, we have uh, patient care responsibilities, education responsibilities, research responsibilities, and in my job as a uh, division chief, I had some administrative responsibilities. What particular area at TGH would you be working in in March of 2017? All of those, uh, I, the clinical assignments were made according to a calendar. So for example, um, when we, we have to have someone immediately available 24 hours a day and a backup person. We also have assignments to say the ICU or the inpatient floor or the clinic. So in March of 2017, um, my clinical assignments would have been either as the on-call surgeon or uh, assigned to the ICU. The ICU being the intensive care? That's right. Okay. Uh, directing your attention to uh, March 13th of 2017, do you recall a patient by the name of Trevor Summers being treated by you or uh, excuse me, students that you were supervising at the time that were treating this patient at TGH? I don't have any independent memory uh, other than what's indicated in the chart. But the chart shows that I was responsible for the people taking care of him that day. When a person is admitted to the hospital, uh, specifically sticking with TGH, were records notated as to why the patient was seen? Yeah, that's... Yes, that's part of the medical record. Is it also notated as to the medications that are ordered and then given to the patient? Yes. Is it notated as to the type of treatment that the person receives? Yes. And are those the records that you're referring to that would have uh, been notated in regards to the treatment of Trevor Summers on March 13th of 2017? That's right. Now, in regards to medications that are given, are all medications that are ordered by a physician ultimately given to a patient? No. So just because they're ordered doesn't mean it's actually given? That's correct. 
when you're looking at records of a patient's treatment, are you specifically looking for where those medications are given? There are, so there's, how it works is if you are, if you intend to give a patient a medication, you write an order in the chart. That order is listed someplace uh, where the nurse usually can see it and if the nurse intends to give the medication, they will mark in a different place when and where it was given. So on March 13th of 2017, was Trevor Summers given a dosage of fentanyl? That's what the... Meeting the witness. Rephrase. Dr. Chesla, do you recall what medication Trevor Summers was ultimately given uh, that he was administered on March 13th of 2017? Yeah, I, I don't remember, but the chart indicates that he was given a dose of fentanyl. And what was the dosage? If I remember right, it's 100 micrograms. Is that a standard dosage? It's typical, yes. What is the purpose for providing uh, fentanyl, uh, that dosage, to a patient? Usually it's for pain relief. What is the time frame in which, when that dosage of fentanyl is given, that it would wear off? Fentanyl is useful because it's rapid onset and, and rapidly, um, rapid onset, rapid off. So it usually, uh, starts to take effect within a minute or two and usually lasts somewhere between a half an hour to 40 minutes. And per the chart for Trevor Summers, were you able to ascertain at what time that that dosage was given to him? Uh, I think the chart says uh, somewhere around, I, I'd have to look. Would referring to the medical records refresh your memory? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd rather do that than guess. If you could look at that and then look up when you're done, not reading from it directly, please. So the record says that he was given 100 micrograms of fentanyl at 12.18. Being 12.18 p.m.? That's right. Okay. And you said that it's usually, it's given because it wears off faster, is that right? Well, it's given for pain. We choose that one specifically because it acts quickly and wears off quickly. And so when we're doing things like making assessments, we want to have uh, there be like no confounding problems of medications. So when you are Providing this dosage of fentanyl to a patient, is that before you conduct any type of an assessment or exam of the patient? It depends on the patient's condition. So, uh, for example, if someone came in with uh, extremity fractures and they just can't cooperate with an exam, we'd give them some pain relief so they can calm down and we can get a better exam. Uh, it's, all, it's really all dependent on what the needs of the patient are, honestly. If the patient is given that dosage, prior to an exam, can the exam still be done? Usually, yes. Can the doctor or the nurse still uh, communicate with the patient? Yes. As to what the patient is feeling in regards to why they're at the hospital? Yeah, at, at, at those doses, our standard doses, uh, yeah, that's all still possible. Are you able to obtain consent from a patient after having that dosage of fentanyl being given for any type of procedures? So we get consent judging the patient's response to our questions, not necessarily based on what the actual dose is. So if we give someone some, uh, like if we give someone a dose of fentanyl uh, and they are able to uh, answer our questions and display some understanding, then we consider that consent. Does that dosage of fentanyl impair a person's cognitive ability in any way? Generally not. Does it cause them to uh, be drowsy? Uh, well, it can. Uh, generally not at those doses, and it, you assess that just by examining the patient. Does it impair the ability for the patient to be able to talk with the doctor or the nurses? 
Usually not. If it does, then you notice it on physical exam. Now, I want to direct your attention to an exam that was done at 12.27 approximately by Dr. Bradley Franklin Heckler. What does it mean for a doctor to note in a record that the patient was oriented to time and person and place? So we just, we do a gross assessment of someone's cognitive function uh, by asking them really, you know, if they know who they are, if they know where they are, and they know what time it is. What does it mean that the, if there's a notation that there is a non-toxic appearance? It's sort of a qualitative eyeball test where someone, you look at someone and you think that person looks sick or they don't look sick. So non-toxic would indicate that they don't look globally sick. And then a notation indicating that the patient was active. What does that mean? Uh, just it's another way of phrasing that someone's awake and moving spontaneously and uh, not sleeping, essentially. From your view of the records, were you able to ascertain the amount of blood loss that Trevor Summers received? Uh, no, uh, not directly. He suffered a superficial injury to his neck. It didn't involve any major blood vessels. It didn't um, alter his vital signs substantially or his end organ perfusion, things like being awake, making urine, that kind of thing. Did he require a blood transfusion? No. If the fennel was given to Trevor Summers at approximately 12, 18 p.m., would he have any lasting effects from that dosage around 1.10 p.m.? Objection. Assuming facts, not in evidence. Hold it's on. not been... No, that's overruled. You can answer the question, doctor. Say again, please. If the fentanyl dosage that we've been talking about was given to Mr. Summers at 12.18 p.m., would you expect there to be any effects, lasting effects, from that dosage around 1.10 p.m.? Generally not. Um, there may be some residual analgesic effects. Uh, generally, fentanyl wears off pretty quickly as it's redistributed in the bloodstream. Um, and the half-life is pretty short. So we typically think of things like, you know, you give someone uh, a dose of fentanyl, half of it's gone within about an hour, hour and a, or within about 40 minutes to an hour, generally speaking. What do you mean by analgesic? Pain Anal control. I'm sorry? Pain control. Pain control. State will pass witness. Cross-examination. Good afternoon, Doctor. Doctor, you were not his treating physician, correct? Uh, I would say that, ugh, man, um, okay, I did not provide direct treatment to him. I was responsible as the attending physician uh, assigned to the trauma resuscitation team and a supervising physician to the trainees in the emergency department, like our residents and fellows. Well, I mean, in layman's terms, did you ever meet the patient? Did you ever talk to him? I have no memory of meeting him. Uh, my standard practice would be to have examined him before he was discharged. So that's your standard practice, but you don't have any recollection of that's, that? That's right. I have no reason to think I didn't, but I don't remember him at all. Would you have treated the wound to his neck? I would not personally have done. We do, like at this institution, our responsibilities uh, cover things like general supervision. So sewing up a superficial laceration in the emergency department would be something I would have done as a general supervising person to someone who did the actual suturing. 
And, and again, you don't have any recollection of this. It's just from reading from the notes. That's right. Do you know if the patient had ever requested medication? I don't know. Do you know if the patient ever signed a consent for medication? I don't know. Do you know if Mr. If Mr. Uh, Summers was Bakerite? I just from reviewing the chart, I know that it was considered. I don't know if it was ever enacted. Do you know if uh, he was actually examined by psychiatrists to determine if he should be Baker active? I read that there, I saw that there were psychiatry notes in the chart, but I didn't read them. Would it matter to you at all uh, if he was going to be Baker active as to whether you would give him any of these drugs? No. In addition to fentanyl, wasn't he also given lidocaine? Yeah, he was. He got an injection of lidocaine at the site of his wound for anesthetic purposes. Wasn't he also given an, a second injection of fentanyl, 50 milligrams? I didn't see that in the record. Uh, you see the first one, the 100. I'm on page 49. Uh, I've got to make sure I'm on the right page that you are. I'm looking at... Well, mine says page six. I'm sorry. But I don't know if I'm... May I, may I approach the yeah, witness? Absolutely, yes. You take a look at I have. See if that can refresh your recollection. Well, the, the one that... The one I'm looking at here is an order that indicates that it was ordered but not necessarily given and here it says that it had expired i don't uh i don't know what what point that was at least at the time of this printing that order had expired so in the column on the right generally speaking if something was given it'll have an indication that says completed uh or you know the, the status of that order will be noted. So what can you tell us from what you can recall? Was he given that second amount of fentanyl or not? Again, I don't recall anything, but just looking at the records, I don't have any reason to think he was given a second dose of fentanyl. It may have been ordered, but the, it's called the MAR. Uh, it doesn't show that he was given it, and this says it, it, it had expired. Wasn't he also given morphine? There's, I didn't see anywhere in the MAR that he was given morphine. It may have been ordered, but not necessarily given. And how about oxycodone, Percocet? Same thing. Order. Or again, may I approach the witness? You may. I'm going to show you again, see the medical records, that he was prescribed oxycodone and it was prescribed morphine? Yeah, these were ordered, but were not given. Do you know why they would be ordered but not given? Uh, it's kind of standard practice to give the nurses a number of options based on what the patient's needs are. So, for example, um, we often choose a short-acting agent like fentanyl because we want to give a short duration of medication. If we want something to last longer, we would give morphine, and if they're able to take oral agents or we want it to last even longer, we would give oral agents. But usually we, the nurses, like I said, they have a, an option of a number of drugs to give depending on what the patient's needs are. And then we leave that up to their discretion. Doctor, you've testified in court proceedings before? Yes. Can you tell us, to a reasonable degree of medical probability, of the doses of medication that was given to him would be totally insufficient to render Mr. Summers unable to waive his right to Miranda warnings? Uh, I got to make sure I understand that. Are you asking me if 100 milligrams of fentanyl would unequivocally make him un... Or, uh, could you rephrase that? No, I'm asking it the other way around. <laughs> the around. I'm asking the other way around. I'm asking, with a reasonable degree of medical probability, can you tell this jury that the dosage of medication given to him was insufficient to render Mr. Summers unable to waive his Miranda rights? Judge, I'm going to 
broke. Announce your ruling. Uh, well, rephrase the question. Okay, I was just okay. Yes, sir. doctor. You've given us your uh, medical opinion uh, about the amount of fentanyl that was given. Questions were asked about how it would and how it would affect him in being able to answer. And I'm asking the specific question. Within a reasonable degree of medical probability. Objection. Sustained. Right. I'll ask, let me rephrase the question. Can you give us your opinion about whether the medications that were provided to Mr. Summers, the fentanyl, and anything else that was given to him, was insufficient to render Mr. Summers unable to make a decision of waiving his Miranda rights and speaking to the police? I'll answer that by saying the amount of fentanyl that he was given did not interfere with our physical exam, us being able to get consent to repair his neck or cooperate with uh, getting history and physical. So, you know, I, I don't really know about the Miranda rights thing, but it didn't interfere with his ability to understand and uh, give us consent to repair his neck. We asked that question before your answer was you were unqualified to make that answer. Is that pretty much what you're saying about making the specific answer about you're asking, Miranda warnings? Yeah, you're, you're asking me specifically about Miranda stuff. That's not really my thing, but if you're asking if that amount of fentanyl would have impaired his ability to communicate normally with somebody, I would say that amount of fentanyl was not enough to make him or to in, impair his ability to communicate. You, 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 would you agree with me that communicating with someone, maybe telling them medical history or something, is totally different from speaking to law enforcement about whether you want to waive your constitutional rights to speak to them about these crimes that are being alleged? I don't, Difference. Have, I don't have an opinion on that, really. Fair enough. No further questions. Redirect. Nothing, Your Honor. May this witness be released by the state? Yes. And released by the defense? Yes. Doctor, you may step down. You may be released as a witness at this time. Gentlemen of the jury, it is 12.15, and it is perfect time for lunch. I am going to release you to lunch at this time. I'm going to remind you of my previous instructions not to discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else, also not to do any research related to the case. It is 12.15. I'm going to give you an hour and 15 minutes, which will give you time to get out of the courthouse and get something to eat. I saw on the news this morning that it is National Cuban Sandwich Day, and Tampa happens to be the 
capital of the world for Cuban sandwiches. There are several places, I'm not recommending any place specifically, but there are several places within walking distance of the courthouse that serve Cuban sandwiches. You decide on your own what you want to eat for lunch. I will see you back here at 1.30. All rise for the jury. after lunch, Ms. Johnson. <laughs> it's not on me. I oh, have no I control over that. Um, we have oh, scheduled you. number, um, we may be calling number six out of order because we, um, she has to, I think, get back to work. So we'll probably call number six after it. Okay, and I, I appreciate, I mean, you don't have to do this, but I appreciate giving the defense a heads up if you're calling them out of order and things like that since you, you know, just it's, uh, all right. not a problem. Um, well, you got an hour and, uh, what did I say, 15 minutes, so have a nice lunch, and we'll pick back up in here at 1.30. Oh, Mr. Marchese, one thing I forgot to mention to you this morning, my JA had indicated to me that the order is it still not there? The order in the JAWS system regarding the transcription of the transcripts, transcription of the depositions, has not been uploaded. Uh, I know. I, she told me this morning I contacted my office. They've contacted the reporting company. They said they're going to go forward with the order that they already have. Excellent. They're Excellent. preparing the transcripts. I'm asking them to expedite the ones I think they're going to need sooner. Excellent. So I'm hoping. Glad to hear it. Anything from the state? Nothing else from the state. Anything from the defense? No, sir. Thank you all. Have a nice lunch.